The build-up to this novel has been pretty epic. The foundations, well, technically the foundations are in McNeil's Iron Warrior novel, Storm of Iron. But the main backstory to it occurs in Dead Sky Black Sun and the short story, The Skull Harvest, which can be found in the Heroes of the Space Marine short story anthology, I believe. And what the short story sets up is nothing less than a full-blown invasion of Ultramar. Yes, Honsu and his Iron Warriors are about to lay the smack down on the Ultra Smurfs. I mean, finally, something interesting is about... <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't complete that sentence with a straight face. I mean, interest in an Ultramarines novel? What am I saying? Never has interstellar war featuring armies of aliens, demons, and genetically modified supermen been so goddamn boring. It fails to be exciting as a piece of military sci-fi, it fails to be interesting as a character study, and worst of all, it fails to do a damn thing of significance. So, if you're still listening, sit back, relax, and get ready for a chapter-by-chapter -chapter review of this novel. Chapter 1 exists for two reasons. The first is to talk about how wonderful the worlds of Ultramar are. Uh, we'll ignore for the fact that whilst life may be good slash better for these people than for most of the Imperium, we're still talking about militarised dogmatic xenophobes. So implying that they represent all that is good in humanity is stretching it just a little. The second reason is to provide an info dump for those of us that couldn't afford £30 for the limited edition novella that begins the invasion of Ultramar itself. Now, in fairness, it's not the worst way of kicking something off, and when the demon host arrives to burn a agricultural world, it's not a terrible scene. It's just a shame that things don't get much better. Chapter 2 sets up a plot point that was utterly absent from the killing ground in Courage and Honor, thus prompting a great deal of eye rolling from yours truly. After some textual wanking over how awesome Papa Smurf is, we get a three-way between Uriel, Pisanius, and Learchus. It is a scene whose only purpose is to wash away any last vestiges of character conflict between Uriel and Learchus. Now, whilst that does technically constitute a logical evolution of the relationship between Uriel and Learchus, certainly given the events of Courage and Honor, it nevertheless is just one more element of interest that's been ripped from this series. There's a little more jerking off over how wonderful McCrag is, and then it's off to play a Calgar secret meeting room, and an introduction to the captains of the Ultrasmurfs, complete with bigging up the mortal god status of player Calgar, as well as the gloriousness of the other captains of the Ultrasmurfs. The only upside to this entire chapter is the appearance of the Raven Guard. Chapter 3 introduces us to the Raven Guard, a tech mage from the Mechanicus, and some peeps from the Inquisition, specifically the Order Malleus. This chapter is basically some exposition, and a way for everyone in-universe to hear what happened in the last few Ultra Smurf novels. I, I guess I just couldn't be bothered to stump up 15 or 20 quid for them, but whatever. It also features the earth-shattering revelation that... Player Calgar told a fib. Oh my God. To be fair, the fib was that he couldn't kill a demon, so he trapped it in a Romilly's class star fort under heavy guard. The same Romilly's class star fort that the demon was freed from, took over, and is now using as a base of operation for Honsu's entire invasion of Ultramar. So, just to quickly recap here. Uriel violates the Codex Astartes ever so slightly and defeats the Tyranid High Fleet, but gets sent on a suicide mission for his trouble. Player Calgar, on the other hand, lies to the entire Imperium, the consequences of which could be the destruction of some of the most loyal and productive worlds in the entire Imperium, and he gets away with it. In a better universe, Ultramar would be a festering slag heap by now, given how self-destructively stupid they all are. Oh, and there's some tedious prattle about Uriel having a destiny! Blah, blah, blah. Chapter 4 has one of the few genuine shocks in this novel. 
namely admitting that the Ultra Smurfs are not as good at stealth as the Raven Guard. It's a small admission that their skills aren't perfect, but it's good for all that. Other than that, it's just a small counter-attack on the world that got pwned in Chapter 1, and, you know, full credit to McNeil here. He managed to A. Have his Ubermarines walk into an obvious trap. Sorry, sack of mediocrity. And B. Make a battle between a company of Ultramarines and a horde of corn berserkers boring. I mean, that takes some skill. Sadly, Uriel and his chums dodge death by nuclear fire. Chapter 5 is actually a pretty good chapter overall. An ultramarine war fleet gets utterly ruffle stomped and we spend some time with our Darry Vanes, the one of the few truly interesting characters left in this series. It sets up a few things for him and, interestingly, the newborn. To save you wondering, not a lot is done with it. We also get a speech from the demon Makar, you know, the demon that player Kalgar so bravely forgot to kill. Oh, there's just so much promise in this novel. And on to chapter 6, and we spend half of it with the librarian Tagurus as he checks the future, and then he sets about enabling the future he saw by telling player Kalgar the future. The other half of the chapter is spent on the Vive Victors with Uriel. There's a moment where the ambitions of Cato Sicarius, the captain of the Ultra Smurfs Second Company, is briefly discussed by uh, Persanius, Laarchus, and uh, Admiral Tiberius. But Uriel steps in and says, No! We're Ultramarines! We can't have something as interesting as a character clash! The Inquisitor bores and tries to build some drama by implying that Tiberius uh, might be wrong in his predictions. Here's a quick spoiler. He isn't. Chapter 7 spends a bit of time with Sakaris as he displays something resembling competence. Then it's off to see Claire Kalgar fail the Kobayashi Maru and crash his old jalopy into a planet. Boy, am I glad that this dense fucker is in charge. Chapter 8 kicks off with some more competence from Sakaris and the second company. Then it's off to watch Uriel play with his codpiece as he names his dull as hell command squad the Swords of Kalth. Then there's some drama as Honsu arrives at Kalth and infects the orbital defense grid with a virus. That'll teach them not to update their firewall. 